Hey, if you are new, I hope that today you feel loved, seen, wanted, and welcomed. I hope that you find a place to belong here, that this is a place where you can become and you can be discipled and you can fall in love with Jesus like never before. It's my great hope for your life. So excited to jump into this new series of messages today, talking about the king and his kingdom. And as we get started today, I wanna talk about many people's perception or conception of Christianity and the Christian gospel. Many people's conception of the Christian gospel goes something like this. 2,000 years ago, a man named Jesus came from heaven to earth. He lived a good life, performed some miracles. But then he died on the cross for the forgiveness of sins, and then he was placed in a grave. Three days later, he got up out of that grave and he returned to heaven, where now he is waiting to someday come back again. And if you believe that in your heart, then you too will get to go to this magical place called heaven when you die. And so pray this prayer, believe it in your heart, and you'll get to go to heaven when you die. Oh, and then P.S., P.S. If you've got like time for it, be kind to other people. And like if it fits in your schedule, like go to church and eat all the Chick-fil-A you can. And, you know, like, don't watch rated R movies unless, they're, unless it's the passion of the Christ, okay? If it's the passion of the Christ, then you can watch rated R movies. But other than that, like, try to stay away from it. And, like, don't do black tar heroin, okay? Like, <laughs> we'll see you up there in the streets of gold. Bye! <laughs> and, like, for most people, that's the general conception of the Christian gospel, and listen, today, like, it's for the most part pretty true, okay? Um, but it's radically incomplete. This is what theologians have often called the gospel of salvation. The gospel of salvation. And this is the form of the gospel that I grew up hearing week after week that was preached at the church that I attended, that I knew and only knew for many years of my life. Jesus came, Jesus lived, and Jesus died, and Jesus rose. He died for your sin. If you believe in him, then you can go to heaven when you die. Just kind of like hang out and wait for him to come back. But I want for you to know today that truth be told, that is but a drop in the ocean to what Christianity is actually about. Now, make no mistake, the real historical sin atoning, wrath absorbing, death defeating cross and resurrection of Jesus stands at the very center of our faith, stands at the blazing center of our faith. But the life that permeates out from there is more infinite than all of the galaxies in the cosmos. I wanna invite you through this next series to reconsider and to reimagine Christianity as you know it. I wanna invite you to just stop and pause and think for a second if maybe, just maybe, you have reduced Jesus down and sold Jesus short and perhaps missed his main message entirely. I wanna propose for you today that Christianity is infinitely better than just getting your ticket to heaven punched. I wanna propose for you today that Christianity is infinitely better than receiving a get out of hell free card. Christianity is exponentially more thrilling and exciting and interesting and robust and relevant and practical and ever expanding and all encompassing than just having a quiet time in the morning, coming to church when it's convenient and then sitting back with Kirk Cameron waiting for the rapture to happen. And I want you to know that if you got that Kirk Cameron left behind a joke, well done, okay? <laughs> and if you missed it, like if you never saw this movie, consider yourself blessed and highly favored by God. But I want for you to know that there's so much more than praying a prayer, doing a Jesus calling devotional, coming to church on the weekends when you don't have a better option, and then just waiting to go to heaven when you die. There is this story, this grand, beautiful, infinite story about the king and his kingdom. 
If no one has ever told you before, then let me tell you today that the totality of Christianity is about the king and his kingdom. Maybe you're familiar with this gospel of salvation and praise God for that. It's what I grew up on, but there is more, so much more. The gospel of salvation is just peace and part of this greater, grander, more epic, history-shaping, reality-shifting story that Jesus calls the gospel of the kingdom. I want to give you some resources because I'm a nerd at the start of this journey together. And so here are three books that you can read if you're interested in this. Number one is The King Jesus Gospel by Scott McKnight. For the love of God, read this book, okay? It is so good and it's going to radically shatter the paradigm that you probably have for the gospel. And it'll leave yourself asking, did I even know the gospel before? And am I even saved? Trust me, you probably are, okay? Don't panic, but read this book. Um, Second is The Divine Conspiracy by Dallas Willard. This is one of the most formative books in my entire life. Few books have shaped the way that I view life in the world and my relationship with the Lord more than The Divine Conspiracy by Dallas Willard. And he really talks about what life in the kingdom of God looks like. And then finally, Empire of the Risen Sun. This is like a masterclass on the kingdom. It's like, that's like going to seminary, okay, on the kingdom. There's book one and book two, and it, it'll take you like 26 hours to read them. So they are dense, but, but please, in this season, really, I want... I wanna invite you to just consider, do I understand the kingdom? If I would have asked you before today, before you walked in and you knew what series we were doing, what Jesus talked about most, what would your answer have been? I got good news for you. I pulled some people who didn't know the name of the series and uh, they said that if you would have asked them what Jesus talked about most, what they would have said is they would have said he talked about things like this. He would have talked about things like love, and money, and peace, or kindness, or forgiveness, or salvation, or heaven and hell. But I want for you to know that what Jesus talked about most consistently and most passionately, and what he gave the most vivid imagery to was the kingdom of God. It was The primary thing coming out of his mouth, everything is interconnected and interwoven into this beautiful story that he tells about the kingdom of God. Sometimes the Bible refers to it just as the kingdom. Other times it calls it the kingdom of his son. Matthew refers to it as the kingdom of heaven. Paul calls it the kingdom of Christ or the kingdom of Christ and God. But it's all one kingdom, the same kingdom, Jesus' kingdom. When I started to understand this whole kingdom of God concept, when I got into this kingdom of God business, it was like God opened a portal into a whole new world and I was on a magic carpet with Aladdin and Ariel and the Teletubbies, okay? It was just, it was supernatural. It was like there was this whole other dimension that I had been entirely missing in my relationship with the Lord. It's as if my eyes were open and the scales fell off and I began seeing everything all over again as if I was seeing it for the very first time. The invitation into the life of the kingdom has been the expansion of everything in my life. As I've started to really embrace life in the kingdom, emotions have gotten sharper. Peace has gotten deeper. Joy has become sweeter. Love has become more costly. Forgiveness has been something I've been way more frivolous with extending. I see my responsibility and part to play in the kingdom of God, not as an obligation, but as an opportunity and an honor and a dignity. I no longer see the kingdom of heaven as something that will happen way out there in the future, but it's something that's right here, right now, in front of us, all around us, living within us. I know this is gonna sound so weird, but once I got kingdom eyes, I started to see art and trash differently. It changed the way that I saw politics and parenting, time and money, people and power, poverty and riches, prayer and music, projects in the backyard and sermons I preach on Sunday morning. Seeing life through the lens of the kingdom of God, it changed everything. Now, 
for some of you, this might sound overwhelming and ethereal and hyperbolic and like something that's just reserved for the spiritual elite. But I want for you to know that that's not the case. There's this great, beautiful little scripture that I want to share with you today. Luke chapter 12, verse 32. Fear not, little flock, for it's your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Just try to feel that for a second. Fear not, little flock, for it's your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. I like haven't been able to get this imagery out of my mind in preparation for this sermon series. Like just come with me on this for a second. Like I've got this picture of Father God in heaven with this giddy sort of anticipation thinking about you receiving the kingdom. Like I see God up there right now on his throne, probably off his throne, like pacing back and forth in jolly anticipation like a parent the night before Christmas morning thinking about their six-year-old getting a puppy or their 16-year-old getting ready to have a car and just being so excited knowing that they don't know what they're getting tomorrow, but what they get tomorrow is going to change everything. And I've just got that image in my mind of your father in heaven right now thinking about the day that the kingdom of God breaks through in your life. Could you just imagine that for a second? That that's what God feels, it's his good pleasure to give you the kingdom. And it doesn't mean that you're not gonna have to clean up some poop from the puppy or put some gas in the car or change your schedule or get a job so you can pay. It doesn't mean that things aren't gonna change, but. It, but it means that things are gonna be infinitely better than you could have ever imagined before. It's your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Let me tell you the big idea for this series right up front. Contrary to popular belief, Jesus did not primarily come to start a religion. Jesus came to establish a kingdom. And every day, everywhere, spiritual but tangible kingdom. And infinitely better than just getting you into a mysterious place called heaven. When you die, Jesus came to get heaven into you and me. For it to not be a place but a communion with the presence of the living God. As one writer put it, Jesus came to bring the life of God into the soul of man. Jesus didn't come to just take your sins away and carry us off to a land called heaven. Jesus came to take over and bring heaven to earth. All right, let's get started. That's enough preamble. Outside of a two paragraph snapshot in Luke 2, avoid Jesus in the temple. These words in Mark chapter 1 verse 15 are some of the first recorded words out of the mouth of Jesus. Being that Mark is likely the first gospel in circulation, and this is the initial historical picture and portrait that people have of Jesus. I don't know about you, but as I read the gospel of Mark, I always get this feeling that Mark is in a terrible hurry. That he's got something that he wants to share with you that he's just trying to get to so quickly. Like as you read through the story, he says almost nothing about how Jesus was born or where he grew up. He gets through Jesus' baptism in no time flat. He barely mentions Jesus' temptation in the wilderness, a small introduction to John the Baptist, and then racing through these 14 verses, the prologue is over, and he says, now, now, and prepare yourself because this story's got more drama than the Game of Thrones. Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God and saying the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Let's talk about John getting arrested. Prepare yourself for the drama. Now, after John was arrested, John the Baptist serves as a sort of frontline infantry to the Jesus movement. He prepares the way and sounds the trumpet that King Jesus is on his way. Well, John just got arrested. 
He's arrested by Herod Antipas, son of Herod the Great, the Roman Jewish client king of Judea. John publicly condemned the illegal marriage of the sexually crazed Herod Antipas who just married his dead brother's wife. King Herod didn't like someone telling him how to live, so he throws John in prison. According to the Roman historian Josephus, sometime after baptizing Jesus, John the Baptist was killed at the palace fortress of Macarius in modern day Jordan. According to the Bible, Herod initially resisted killing John because of his status as a holy man. However, after his stepdaughter gave him a lap dance, he said he'd give her whatever she wanted. And so after these birthday party shenanigans promoted by her revengeful, vindictive mother, Salome asked for the head of John the Baptist on a platter. And the stepdad Herod obliged. The historian Josephus confirms that Herod Antipas slew John the Baptist after imprisoning him at Macarius. But Josephus has a unique take on the reason John is killed. Josephus writes, and I quote, it was because Herod feared John's influence might enable him to start a rebellion. Do you feel the polarization, the politicization, the kingdom controversy, the kingdom conflict that Jesus is walking into the middle of? There was a clash of kingdoms then. Look right at me. There will be a clash of kingdoms now. Today, as I talk about this message of the kingdom of God, the kingdoms of this world will stand in direct opposition to the advancement of the kingdom of God in your life. If you want this, if you really want this, you'll have to be willing to go to war for it. As Jesus says, the kingdom is advancing and the violent take it by force. Mark then says, drama continues, Jesus came into Galilee. Now, there are two things that are very important that I want to draw your attention to in terms of Galilee. Number one, Galilee is on the outskirts of Judea. It's on the fringe, away from the Roman authorities in Jerusalem. This gave Jesus an opportunity to form his spiritual militia underground, behind the scenes, and without the threat of Herod's army seeking to find and kill any of John the Baptist's supporters or common rebels. So Jesus, in Galilee, calls his first disciples. His ragtag group of fishermen, tax collectors, and zealots who would join this kingdom movement and take on the powers that be. This is part of the way that the kingdom works, which is so gorgeous. This kingdom is a backwards kingdom, an upside down, but in reality, right side up kingdom. In this kingdom, the last become first, the least become the greatest, and the fishermen sit on thrones and rule. More on that later. Thing number two is this. In the Old Testament, we're told that the United Kingdom, this is so cool, the United Kingdom, kingdom of Israel and Judea first fall in the north to the Assyrians. This means that Galilee, northern Israel, was where the kingdom of the God in the Old Testament had fallen. Jesus marches into Galilee, the very place the kingdom first fell, in order to put the kingdom back together. I love the tapestry that Jesus is putting together. Mark says he comes proclaiming the gospel. Let me hear you say gospel. gospel. Now that word gospel was used by kings before it was ever used by Christians. We hear gospel and we think gospel music. We think the letters of Jesus' life. We think the story of Jesus' life. That's what we think when we see gospel. But gospel was ruler language before it was ever religious. When Jesus and the writers of the Bible used the word gospel, they were hijacking a common word that was used by kings in their culture. In Rome, when a Caesar would succeed in any way, shape, or form, they would shout gospel. And so if they were off at war and they won the battle, they would come back shouting gospel. If a Caesar had a newborn son who could take his rightful place in the empire, they would shout gospel. If there was anything that seemed noteworthy, deemed by the Roman elite, they would shout gospel or Gileon, meaning good news. In the ancient world, when there was a war or a battle, people in the city didn't know what was happening. I don't know if you know this or not, they didn't have Twitter back then, or X, or Instagram, or CNN, or whatever it is that we have today, which means that people didn't know as much, but they were much nicer to each other, hallelujah. 
And so the way that they relied on getting their good news was through these heralders or through these runners or through these gospel bringers. These runners would sprint back from the battlefield to tell people what was happening. Now, one interesting note on this is that they would be rewarded for good news and punished for bad news. Have you ever heard the phrase, don't shoot the messenger? Have you ever been the messenger who didn't want to get shot? This is where that phrase comes from. These gospel runners would come back, and if they had bad news, the king in his frustration would be like, well, it's going bad anyways. Might as well start by killing you. And so that's the way that it would work. And something that was so crazy is that once the outcome of a war was known, this, this marathon runner would run back and they would give the report. And there would be these watchmen, just try to catch this, this image. There would be these watchmen who were on a tower waiting and looking out as far as the eye could see. And in the distance, they would see the dust moving as the runner sped back to the city to give the report from the battle. The watchmen were trained, so interesting, to tell by the way the runner's legs were turning whether the news was good news or bad. If the runner's legs were flying and the dust was kicking up, that meant good news. But if he was doing the survival shuffle, it indicated a different verdict. It indicated bad news that a new king had been crowned. Jesus walks into the dusty streets of Galilee, kicking up the dust of first century Jerusalem, proclaiming the gospel that a new king has been crowned. Then he says, the time is fulfilled. Now make no mistake, the life of Jesus splitting time 2,000 years ago was no coincidence. It was a defining moment in redemptive history. As I'll show you momentarily, all the way back to page one of the Bible, the kingdom of God is the big idea. The first prophetic mention of this is in Genesis where it says that the seed of the woman will crush the serpent's head and the serpent will bruise his heel. And from that moment in Genesis, there is this anticipation building in the people of God that one day there will be a great snake crusher who will come, who will right everything that went wrong in Eden. There will be this Messiah, this King, this Christ, this anointed one who will redeem the people, who will fight the enemies, who will win the war, who will set the captives free. And Jesus comes on the scene and he says, all that you've been eagerly awaiting for, all that you've been expecting, all that you've been longing for, the countdown has hit zero. The date that was circled on the calendar is finally here, right here, right now, today, before your very eyes, the long expected king has arrived. The king has come. Jesus says the kingdom of God is at hand that it's at hand, that it's right in front of you. You could reach out and grab it. You could touch it, taste it, feel it, sense it, see it, witness it. It was no longer a longed for hope. It was a present, received, given, participated in reality. The kingdom of God is at hand. All right, let's talk kingdom. As Americans, we're not super familiar with kingdom, are we? Like, we ain't never had a king. Okay, we had a king a long time ago. We didn't want him. We kicked him out. And so for us, we're not kingdom people. We're free people. God bless the USA. Bald eagles. Barbecue. Amen, right? But there still remains within us this fascination with the things of the kingdom. It's like we can't shake it. Doesn't matter how far removed we get. We just can't outgrow it. There's some intrigue and enthrall in us for the kingdom. So we watch kingdom shows, whether it be Game of Thrones or The Crown or the greatest one of all time, The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. <laughs> Don't make me rap it, y'all, okay? Like, y'all got to laugh harder or I'm going to rap Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. But there, there's this fascination with the kingdom within us, but because we've never lived in a kingdom with a monarch, we've never, uh, unless you're from over the pond and you sip tea and crumpets, then you've never had a king. You've never been in a kingdom. And so for us, in our very Western mindset, when we think kingdom, we think space and place. That's Western thought, a, a palace and boundary lines, borders and a territory. That's what we think about when we think about the kingdom. And so in our minds, kingdom always has to be this, this place. It's got to be a city or an establishment or 
like heaven someday where there's territory and streets and a city. But in the Eastern mind, it's not that they wouldn't think about space or place. It's just that they wouldn't primarily think about space or place. When they thought about the kingdom, they would think about it in terms of rule or reign. More important than where the kingdom was is what the kingdom is like. The kingdom of God, like every other kingdom, has a culture and a currency. It's got celebrations and a constitution called the Bible, a national meal called communion or in the Old Testament, Passover. The kingdom has laws and embassies that's called the church. The kingdom has enemies and counterfeit kings who clash with the kingdom of God and try to overthrow the rightful king. And we see this grand, beautiful, cosmic, redemptive story on page one of the Bible. From the very outset, the story begins to unfold. And on page one, the writers are talking about the kingdom of God. When humans are created in Genesis 1, the Bible says that we're given dominion. Just grab a hold of these theological ideas. It's going to be so good. We are designed, you are designed to rule and to reign, to exercise authority over creation. We see this in Genesis 1.28. And God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. As you can see, this dominion, this rule, this reign, this authority that God wants to give to you and to me, his co-rulers, is not a small dominion. It's a multi-dimensional dominion, fish of the sea, birds of the heavens, which would be like the sky or the air, and every living thing that moves on the earth, sea, sky, land. He's essentially saying, on this earth, the boundaries of your dominion know no end. God says, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Again, this is, this is kingdom language. Lost on our ears, but piercingly clear for the first century Jew. He's saying, expand the borders of Eden. Extend your line. Fill this kingdom with citizens, ambassadors, explore, adventure, take over more territory, make other places on earth like this garden called Eden. Subdue the earth, bring it under your authority or control. I don't have time to get into this today, but in the Hebrew mind, God doesn't as much make something from nothing as he brings order to chaos. When you see the Genesis narrative in your mind, it's just like there was nothing and then boom, everything was there. But for the writers of the Bible, they, they would have seen this like this ooze of chaos, this dark abyss of nothingness that was like stormy. And then out of that, God ordered and brought and created. And he's going, I have made you to do the same. So this Eden is so ordered, but I want for you to move out of here and order, subdue the rest of the world. So this happens because humans were made in what the Bible calls the Imago Dei the image of God. It's a revolutionary idea for humans who have never heard it before, for every person who has not yet stepped into the boundaries of the kingdom and they've never heard about the good news of the kingdom. This idea is like flabbergasting, it's preposterous, it feels impossible. But the story of Jesus goes that, that we are created in the Imago Dei, the image of God. We are made to look like God, to represent God. This very much plays into the ancient feudal system where king, where the king was God's sovereign representative and everyone else on earth was under his rule. And God goes, I have made you to be like that, created in my image, to, put, to be put in a garden made by God, to co-rule with God, to continue the project that God started called Eden. When God made Adam and Eve and Eden, this was essentially his vision. Essentially, the garden of Eden is the first picture we have in the Bible of the kingdom of God. That should blow your mind right now. The first picture or snapshot that we get of what it looks like when God rules and when God reigns, of what kingdom culture and celebrations and laws look like is the Garden of Eden. It's the place where God rules and humans are co-rulers alongside God and his kingdom. 
If you want more on this, John Mark Comer beautifully talks about these ideas in his book, Garden City, as does Tim Mackey in his Kingdom of God episodes on the Bible Project, both of which I highly recommend. But in the Genesis narrative, humans are co-rulers with God who end up rebelling against God's reign. This is the part of the story that you can't miss. This is the reason that there's all of the fractures and the dissonance and the disconnection and the pain and the sorrow and the hurt and the guilt and the shame and the betrayal and the lies and the cheating and the stealing. The reason that all of that exists in society today is because there were these co-rulers who decided to be rebels instead. They launch a coup. They attempt to seize the kingdom of God for themselves to redefine good and evil as they see fit to rule in God's place, to make themselves the center of God's kingdom and to kick God off of his throne. They rise up and they rebel. They take from this good, benevolent, generous king that which is not theirs. As a result, They are exiled from the garden, pushed east of Eden, as the saying goes, and they fall into anarchy. But on their way out, God, the God of the Bible, the one and only ultimate good and sovereign king, does something on page three of the Bible that I've never been able to get over. Instead of doing what he said he would do, where he said that if you eat of this tree, you will surely die. He chooses to not kill Adam and Eve, but make a sacrifice instead. Maybe you missed it. But hidden right there in Genesis 3, it says that God took and he made garments of skin and he clothed the nakedness of Adam and Eve. He is taking a royal robe and he's putting it on these now rebel peasants and saying, you're going to need this for the journey, but one day I'm going to bring you back into the kingdom in totality. He makes a sacrifice, the first sacrifice of the Bible that is pointing towards the moment when he will ultimately have to sacrifice himself, die himself to clothe them, not with the skin of an animal, but with the blood of his son to make them righteous and pure and holy and allow them to come back home. And the story continues. Humanity's descendants multiply, their lineage continues, and they spread across the earth, but things just viciously spiral into anarchy and injustice and violence. So if you don't know the story, God calls this guy named Abraham, and Abraham becomes the father, and he had many sons. Many sons had fought. Come on, you know it, yeah? Yeah. Once again, if you don't know it, blessed and highly favored. (laughs) And Abraham becomes the father of this new people that he will use to rescue and save this fractured society through. And they become what is known as the kingdom of Israel. The kingdom of Israel. Instead of a palace, they had a temple. Because unlike the other nations, they knew who the true king actually was. But if you've like read the first half of the Bible, you know it doesn't go so well for Israel. Kings rise and kings fall. There's okay ones, but mostly evil ones. They had God as their king, but they demanded that they had a man as their king. And so they crowned King Saul. You know what their qualifications was for picking their king? Who's the tallest? And so they just bring in this tall guy who's handsome and good looking and seems strong to be the king that they would follow and substitute having God himself. It goes really poorly. David does the best, but even he is a maniacal, adulterous, murderous disaster. By the end of the Old Testament, we see that Israel, who was supposed to be God's plan to save the world, herself needs to be saved. Whatever has gone wrong in the human condition, in the human heart, so bad, so much worse than we thought. That there's nothing that we can do in and of ourselves to put it back together. There's this thing called sin that started in the garden that's been growing in you and me and all of humanity ever since, and it's like a terminal cancer. It's got this way of deceiving us, tricking us, blinding us, and making us think that the best thing for our life would be to run our life. Now, the great joy that we long for is that if we could be in charge and we could be served and we could be made much of, if we could do what we want, when we want, how we want, if we could throw off the, 
the tyrannical rule of God's law and just follow our heart, that we'd be led into happiness. And like a cancer, it grows and it seduces and it kills and it steals and it's been happening for generations. We can't fix it. We can't fix it with the right person the right person in power. We can't fix it with the right political platform or a new technology or the right economic system. Did you know that in 2024, nine, this is the reason that we're doing this series right now, in 2024, nine of the 10 most populous countries in the world will hold elections? What's getting ready to be before you and me and it's already happened is conversations about power and rule and reign, about policy and authority of who's right and who's wrong and could this system save the world? And we'll be pitted against each other Elephant and donkey, red and blue, Democrat or Republican to believe that some man, some human, some political position could be the catalyst that changes and saves and rescues all of humanity and restores America to a rightful place of prominence. And we'll all see, sing Lee Greenwood together, God bless the USA. But it doesn't work like that. Election cycles come and they go, presidents rise and they fall, and we're left in pretty much the same place as we were before. Because there's no person, no political system that can right what has been wronged in us. As November draws near, remember that what is broken in men can't be fixed by men. It must come down from heaven. So Jesus comes. By the end of the Old Testament, Israel is in exile. God has gone silent. His presence has left the temple, and the people of Israel have this one thing left to hold on to. They've got this prophetic rumor called Uwen Gileon. It's written about in Isaiah, these rumors that this Messiah will come, this king will come, and all of these problems that no king can fix will rescue and restore us. So Israel's in exile. They're in a land that's not their own, or they've been occupied by a king that should not rule. They're having to embrace different customs and different languages and different rules. They're not able to worship God with freedom, They're locked in, in exile, feel cut off from God. And for 400 years, they're in silence. Not a word, just a hope, a prayer, and a promise that ooh and Gileon will come. Good news will come. The Messiah will come. So can you imagine what it must have felt like when Jesus walks into Galilee after 400 years of silence? says the time has come, the kingdom of God is at hand. That statement broke 400 years of silence. It's no wonder that these young teenage disciple fishermen had like wild expectations for what Jesus was going to do. I mean, they're living in the backdrop of the Roman Empire, quite possibly the most epic physical kingdom the world has ever known. In 63 BC, Rome captures Jerusalem. In 40 BC, Rome installed a client king, Herod the Great, who was Jewish in heritage, but Roman in allegiance. And this clash of kingdoms that played out from Eden through Israel was happening all over again. These young boys were subjected to live in their land, but not to be able to do what they want. They couldn't worship God as freely as they desired. They were occupied by a foreign territory who was telling them how to think and how to live and what to do. So when Jesus announces that the kingdom is at hand, it's no surprise that it attracts these young Jewish teenage disciples. I mean, what 14-year-old boy isn't looking for a fight? They're so intrigued to leave behind their nets. You see, we often see it just as if they were following some dude who had a book and some scrolls and could teach them some lessons about peasants or seeds No, they were getting ready to start a rebellion. This is the reason that they're so anxiously awaiting and on the edge of their seat and Peter can't wait to just chop some dude's ear off because they are ready, armed and loaded to be able to take on the powers at B to go toe to toe with Rome. It's what they've been waiting for. You know, I think this understanding of kingdom as it's connected to discipleship is so important. I think that one of the reasons that many churches are shallow on discipleship is because they've lost a vision for the kingdom. Jesus calls disciples not to come and to learn some information, but to participate in a kingdom, to build a kingdom, to advance a kingdom, to war for a kingdom. Like when we talk about you getting discipled, 
I'm not talking about you just intellectually ascribing to some ideas. I'm talking about you stepping into a new humanity, getting weapons, supernatural weapons equipped for war, ready to go toe-to-toe with darkness, push back the enemy who's encamped against us. That's what discipleship was about for these young boys. The kingdom becomes Jesus' message, mission, and mandate. Look at this. In Matthew 5, we see the Sermon on the Mount is the culture of the kingdom. In Matthew 22, we see the greatest commandment to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself as the only law of the kingdom. In Matthew 13, we see the parables are the true propaganda of the kingdom, telling the story of what the kingdom is actually like. In Matthew 6, 33, we're told to seek first the kingdom. Do you know what that means? Seek first the kingdom. It means everything else is second to the kingdom. It means that there is the kingdom first and everything else after that. In Matthew 24, 14, we're told the gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed through the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come, meaning that the message of the gospel of the kingdom is the key that unlocks the end of time. That until people in all places of the earth, every tribe, tongue, language, and people group hear about the gospel of the kingdom, and somebody from that tribe, tongue, language, or people group enters into this kingdom, the end will not come. Come. Acts chapter 1, verse 3, we see the resurrected Jesus spends 40 days before his ascension into heaven speaking about the kingdom of God. You want to know what Jesus talked about after he beat death, rose from the grave, and dwelled around for 40 days? He's just talking about the kingdom of God. You got to know about the kingdom of God. Let me explain to you what the kingdom of God is like. Do you get it? Do you feel it? Do you sense it? And they still don't. They still don't. They're still like, okay, cool. So at this time, are you going to restore the kingdom of God? No, (laughs) that's not what we're doing here right now, guys. Let me talk to you more about the kingdom of God. Let me help you understand the kingdom of God. Right, so are you gonna kick Caesar out and move in now? Should should we go get our sword? No, let me explain to you more about the kingdom of God. And over and over and over and over and over again, he is trying to shatter the paradigm and the conception that the kingdom of God is this place that we will one day go up in the sky where we'll dwell with him forever and you play harps and sit on clouds and walk on streets of gold and pray that my mansion is bigger than your mansion and get a crown. No, it's not, it's not that. It's something different entirely. For most of us, our only conception is that it would be this some far off distant place, but for 40 days he goes, no, no, it's different. And then then Peter's first sermon at Pentecost in Acts chapter two, verse 36, the bomb drop, his like zinger statement where everybody goes, hallelujah, is let all of the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord, King, and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Mic drop moment, first sermon. You want to know what all of this is about? You killed the king. The book of Acts comes to a close in Acts chapter 28, verse 31, with the apostle Paul spending two years on house arrest in Rome, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord, the king, Jesus Christ, with all boldness and without hindrance. This message of the kingdom is the announcement that Jesus has come to defeat sin, the devil, and the grave. This is the announcement that you and I can be delivered from the kingdom of darkness and transferred to the kingdom of light. This is the announcement that the days of us running our own lives, being subjugated to our own desires, controlled by our lusts, dominated by our demons can be done with. This is the announcement that Jesus has not just come as a baby or as a rabbi or as a guru or as a friend or as your savior. He's come to be your king. Jesus died for the kingdom. You know that, right? If you think back on the story, it's so much more political than you think that it is. The sign that's above his head is what? The king of the Jews. The one who's called himself the king of the Jews. This is a high treason to say that anyone is king but Caesar. Read Acts and the story of Jason when these men come here and they turn the world upside down. And everybody's frustrated in the city because these men are saying that there is a king other than Caesar. It was treason. And they killed Jesus because he would not let go of this radical claim. I am the one 
true king. Jesus is king is the message of the New Testament. Before he died and rose, they primarily called Jesus teacher or rabbi, but after Jesus died and rose, they consistently and almost exclusively call him king. Jesus is Lord. You just start to watch it on play in your Bible. Read the New Testament, watch it. You're not gonna see it a lot in the gospels, but you wait till we get to Acts and Romans and first and second Corinthians and Galatians and Ephesians and Philippians and the confession time and time and time again is this treasonous declaration in the face of Caesar, Jesus is Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ. I need you to know today that Jesus' kingdom vision is not far off or distant. It is not ethereal, it is tangible. Jesus' kingdom is real. It's something you and I participate in and receive and experience. It's something that you can see and hear and that changes the world. Tom Holland, not the Spider-Man version, (laughs) but Tom Holland, the secular antagonistic historian in his groundbreaking book, Dominion, whose subtitle is How the Christian Revolution Remade the World, communicates, don't miss this today, how everything you consider good and normal in the Western world is a byproduct of Jesus Christ. Everything, everything. There's, there's always this message that people wanna put before you that Christians Christianity has caused all these problems, all these fights, all these wars. But I want for you to know that if you'll read this, you'll see that Christianity's done more good than you could possibly imagine. He tells how the last pagan emperor of Rome, Julian, sought to revive paganism in the face of, of grown Christianity. But pagans despised the poor and weak while Christians poured themselves out for the sick, the orphans, and the poor. They, they went to the abandoned infants, and as a result, the masses turned to Christ. Such charity to the needy was unique to the Christian faith. Holland goes on and he talks about the way that the birth of modern science depended on a Christian view of the world as real, as not an illusion, as was held commonly in the East, but that the world was created by a single mind, by a God who created the world with universal laws and order and structure and consistency. See, so often you think that science is opposed to Christianity, In many ways, Christianity created or gave birth to modern science. This idea that things could be known and that things were real and that they could be studied and examined because the God created them in space and time and to be absolute. Holland points out that although the church was imperfect before Christianity, slavery had been universally accepted relatively everywhere in the world. So where did this idea that it was wrong originate from? that it was wrong to own another human, subjugate another human, push another human down for your own good. It originated with Christianity, with saints like Gregory of Nyssa reading what the Bible said about the image of God. Every single person, regardless of skin or gender or socioeconomic status, that you had rights and dignity and value and beauty and that you were worth something. We, we just, we take that so for granted today. We're like, duh, yeah, duh, humans matter. They didn't used to matter until Christianity broke on the scene and changed everything. And while emancipation and uh, and abolition came too slowly, it was spearheaded by Christian groups like the Quakers. Holland talks about, and he shows the way that every person, this this idea that every person has a right to his or her her own body came from Christianity. The idea that sex must be completely consensual was a startling new concept that came into the world through Jesus Christ. This is what the kingdom of God does. It changes the world. It offers a liberating vision for life, an opportunity for us to bear God's image in every sphere and domain and every place of work and influence. And so we as the church today are called to act as an alternative society, a counter narrative, a kingdom that the world tries to push underground, but that is always breaking through. The kingdom of God breaks into every moment where something on earth is done as if the same action were happening in heaven. Every moment you act like God is real and actually on the throne, the kingdom of God is breaking through. 
The kingdom of God breaks in when God gets his way, when he gets what he wants, when things are as the king would have them be. The kingdom of God breaks in at bedsides and kitchen tables where people demonstrate unreasonable hospitality. The kingdom of God breaks in where real conversation happens and tears stain the ground and hugs become suffocatingly tight. The kingdom breaks in where everyday revolutionaries choose simple, hidden, unseen acts of obedience as defiance acts of treason to the powers that be. The kingdom breaks in when net worth doesn't define self-worth, when the atrocities of sin are overwhelmed with the undeserved forgiveness of grace. The kingdom breaks in when addicts walk in freedom and marriages are restored, labels are thrown off, the shackles of lust are broken, families live in harmony, and the gospel isn't seen as a nice fairy tale that you think of every so often, but as a violent rebellion to turn the world upside down. The kingdom of God breaks in. And if this is the kingdom, I say, let the kingdom come. You know, right, that every swipe Every ad, every job, and every boss is pulling you into building a kingdom that will be temporary. They're doing all they can to seduce you into being a worker bee for the sake of their vision. They're staging a silent but violent revolution for your soul. They will do all they can to suck your soul dry, offering you breadcrumbs from the table of their feast, pennies on the dollar for your heart and soul. Jesus is offering you this option. You want to come and participate in my kingdom instead? It's where you come alive and you're made new and your eyes are open and your sin is forgiven and your family is redeemed and you live forever. Can we be people who build the kingdom? I want to close today by reading a gorgeous allegory my friend Tally wrote about the kingdom. Once upon a time, There was a perfect king who gave up his perfect son for his imperfect people. The good and mighty king rescued them from the evil that plagued the land, broke the chains that held them back so that they could become a part of his kingdom. His kingdom had streets that were filled with hope, rivers that flowed with grace. His people never went hungry and were loved unconditionally. Among his people was a young princess One day while in the kingdom garden where she was picking fruits and vegetables of all kinds, basket at her hip, a man stumbled in through the kingdom's gates. He was haggard and beaten, thin from hunger and clutching a deep wound at his side. What is this place filled with such abundance? He breathed out in awe. Taking in the basket of food she was holding in the mighty palace, never in all my years of living have I seen a place like this. The princess, struck by his appearance, looked around at the place she'd become so comfortable in. Finally, she answered the man, well, this is the good kingdom. The man perused the kingdom again, desperation in his eyes. He asked her, who must I be to live in a place like this? filled with shelter and provision and what must I do to deserve this? What price must I pay? The princess paused again and said to the man, absolutely nothing. The good king has already paid your price here. And as long as you abide at his side and believe in his goodness, you are welcome here. The man tears in his eyes. The years of old age wearing on his face took in an unsteady breath and cried out in painful, desperate whisper. Why didn't anyone tell me? The girl went silent as he fell to his knees and wept. 
and finding him a place to lay his head and help for his wounds. The young princess found her way to the palace where she immediately met with this kind face and good king. Seeing the love in his eyes, she began to cry, telling him of what had just occurred. Patiently, he listened. My king, are, are there more? More what, my child? More people who do not know of your goodness. He smiled sadly down at her and replied, you, my daughter, are cherished and loved and cared for by the king of all, yet I do not exist to praise you. Rather, you exist to praise me. The kingdom was created for the purpose of bringing worship to the king, and yet there are people who do not know me. They're living in the darkness trying to escape the monsters that hunt them, but they seek refuge in all the wrong places. Go and tell them of who I am. Invite them into my kingdom. I will feed them. I will shelter them. I will clothe them. Bring worship to my name and praise to their lips. The battle has been won, but the war is not yet over. Your mission is not done. Bring my people home. Princess looked up at the king with heartache and hesitation. But my king, surely there will be harsh terrain, harsh hearts and wild beasts along the path. How can I be the one to do this? My daughter, you will not be alone. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. Now my warrior girl, courageously you must go. Today I'm praying that God's kingdom project gets unleashed on this community. Today, I'm praying that we would remember what it's like to not live in the kingdom of God and the fact that there are people out there starving and dying in sin who do not yet know. I'm praying that the radical claim that Jesus is Lord becomes real for you all over again. I'm praying that you see the kingdom as here and now as bigger than casual church attendance and more attractive than mere morality. I'm praying that this invitation into the kingdom shakes up stagnation, ignites mission, and evokes participation. I'm praying that a holy rebellion starts today. I pray that we see ourselves as a kingdom outpost, a kingdom embassy, a kingdom people who announce the kingdom of God for those old souls who are broken, hurting, and dying, and who do not yet know. Come, Lord Jesus, let your kingdom come.